Want to speed up your language learning? Get access to all of our best PDF cheat sheets for free. Just click the link in the description and sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Kick off. The first word is kick off, kick off. To kick off means to start something. It usually has the nuance of something big, like a big project, like we're going to kick off a new project next year, or let's kick off this new policy in January, or what time should we kick off the party as well? We can use it for parties too, uh, but for business, it means to start a project, to start something new, and it sounds like the beginning to something big. So kick off. To kick off something means to start something. Set out. The next phrasal verb is set out. Set out means decide or determine or choose something. So we usually use set out to mean to decide something within a project. For example, we need to set out some guidelines for this project, or we need to set out some rules for dress code in the company. Or what do you think about setting out some new guidelines for company parties, for example. So set out means to decide something and determine something, usually like a policy, a rule, a guideline. Hmm. Check in. The next phrasal verb is check in. So check in means update or give a status report to share new information, check in about something. We usually say to check in about blah, blah, blah. So uh, for example, uh, what time should we check in about the project? Or do you have time to check in about this later? Or when can I check in with you? We can also use it uh, to refer to a person. So can I check in with you about this later? Or will you check in with me later? We usually say check in with. Please be careful. This is different from check in to a hotel. Totally different meaning. Here at work, check in with someone or check in about something. Uh, so check in with someone means to give someone an update, to share new information with them. Check in about means to share new information, probably with someone, like in a meeting, about a specific project. So you can use check in with or check in about something. Go through, go over. The next one is go through or go over. We can use go through or go over. These both mean to review something. Like I want to go through your essay with you or I want to go over the latest draft with you. I want to go through our new policies with everyone in the company. I want to go over some changes that are going to happen. So it means review, uh, usually like review plus maybe explain. It means to do this in detail usually too. So introduce some new ideas, uh, review some old ideas perhaps, and have a chance to discuss things. So to go through or to go over is sort of to examine, to review, to look at some information with somebody. So we can also say, I want to go over this with you later, or can we go through this together later? So it means to look in detail, to examine something. Clock in, clock out. The next pair of expressions really is clock in and clock out. Clock in is to check in uh, at your office. To clock in uh, means to begin your workday officially, to register the time you begin work and to clock out is the opposite, to register the time when you leave work, when you finish work for the day. So when you, you maybe, depending on your office, you have to clock in, in other words, register or record the time you begin work or arrive at your office, and clock out, so record the time you leave your office. So uh, in a sentence we could say, I always forget to clock in to work. Or, what time did I clock out yesterday? I totally forgot. Or, it's important to clock in and clock out at the same time every day. Start up. Okay, so the next phrasal verb is start up. Start up means begin, to begin something. Please be cautious, start up something, like start up a new policy or start up a new project means to begin a new project. However, you may see the noun expression, no space between start and up. Start up. Maybe you can hear the slight difference in pronunciation. When I say the phrasal verb start up, there's a disconnect between the words. Like we need to start up a new project, for example. However, start up is a little bit different. Start up as a noun means a usually small, 
new company. It's big in the news these days, startups.、Uh, so startup companies are very small companies. They are just beginning. That's the nuance of a startup company. That's the noun phrase, a startup. However, to start up something sounds a little bit different. Like we should start up some new projects this year. It's more used for like policies, projects,、uh, maybe a new product launch.、Um, we should start up some new things, for example. But it means to begin, to begin something. Call back. The next phrasal verb is call back. Call back. Call back means to return a phone call. To return a phone call is call back. So some common examples are just、uh, "I'll call you back later" or "Please call me back when you have time."、Um, you can separate、uh, "call" and "back." Like I just said, "Please call me back when you have time." You can separate the person receiving the call. You can separate "call" and "back" and put the person receiving the call between "call" and "back." So "Please call me back when you have time" or "I'll call you back." So this person between "call" and "back" is the person receiving the call. So、uh, you should call her back later, or、um, why don't you call your mother back tonight, for example? You can separate these two. That's fine.、Uh, one more example sentence would be: "I need to call my clients back this afternoon." Send over. The next expression is send over. Send over means to email or to physically mail something. To send over it means to send to someone else's office or to send to someone else's computer. Send it over there is the idea. Sending it away from you, over to a different building or to a different department. Please send this over when you have a chance. So again, just as with call back. We can use the expression "send over" separately. We can separate these two words.、Uh, please send this over. Please send the files over. Please send the documents over. Or please send over the documents. Both are fine. We can use both of them here. So "send over" just means mail or send something. In another example sentence, "Hey, can you send over the updated files?" Clean up. Clean out. The next phrasal verb is really a pair.、Uh, it's clean up or clean out. We can use clean up and clean out. These are a little bit different, but I put them together because they both use the word clean. So to clean up something means to tidy or to make it nice again. To clean up something, like you need to clean up your house. We can also use this at home, meaning like to wash windows or to、uh, to wash dishes. Or to to make something tidy and clean, to get rid of germs, to keep germs away, to clean up your house, to clean up your office, to clean up your desk. There's a similar phrasal verb, however, clean out. To clean out means to remove everything from some location. So if I say I'm cleaning out my desk, it has the nuance of I'm removing everything from my desk. Maybe I'm leaving my job, for example. Maybe I've quit, or maybe my desk just has a lot of things I don't need. But clean out has the nuance of removing a lot of things. We can also use this、uh, phrasal verb at home, like clean out your closet. I'm cleaning out my closet. So it, cleaning out my closet in that case it means removing everything from your closet. The same nuance applies to your desk. So to clean out your desk at work. Means to remove everything. You can also use this for the refrigerator. Like I need to clean out the refrigerator. It smells really bad. So meaning take everything out, clean it, and maybe put some things back. So clean up is just too tidy. Clean out is like a deep clean of something. Make up for. The next phrasal verb is make up. Make up. Usually make up for. Please be careful. Not. Makeup, as in like things that we put on our face to change our appearance, makeup, but make up for something. So to make up for means to compensate. To compensate. So if there has been a problem in a project, for example, like a delay or a schedule change or some some unexpected thing happens, and you need to compensate for that, you need to make some changes to fix that problem. You can use the phrasal verb make up for. So, for example, 
Our project was delayed because our president got sick, for example. We need to make up for lost time. So we follow make up for with the item uh, that is the problem. So in my example sentence, we need to make up for lost time. Lost time is the problem. We lost time. It should be a noun phrase. We lost time on the project. We need to compensate for it. So we need to make up for lost time. Or we need to make up for the mistake that we made last week. Or we need to make up for lost sales last quarter, for example. Angry. First is the word angry. Angry. So angry is the most basic word you can use. I feel angry. She is angry. He is angry. It's the basic level of a negative and slightly aggressive feeling. My dog looks angry. My boss was angry. Um, we use it to talk about that feeling. So in a sentence, my mother was really angry with me. Furious. Next is furious. Furious. So furious means very angry. So instead of saying, I'm very angry, you can say, I'm furious. This sounds much stronger. It's one word. It means very angry, but it sounds like much stronger than just very angry. So angry is aggressive and negative. Furious is like the next level or maybe two levels up. So like my boss was furious at the team for their mistake or my neighbors were furious with me for my huge pool party last night or I was furious with my brother for locking me out of the house, for example. Uh, one more. My teacher is furious with us today. Mad. The next word is mad, mad. Mad is like going back down to that sort of basic level. Angry and mad are pretty much the same thing. Mad sounds like a word a little kid would use though. Like I'm so mad right now, or I'm so mad I can't do this, or it's like, it's, it's like unhappy with a little bit of aggressive. So it means angry really, but um, a lot of adults don't really use the word mad. Um, it sounds more childish, the word mad does. Like, I'm really mad right now. Um, or I'm mad at you, or she's mad at him, or something like that. It sounds a little bit childish, the word mad. So another example sentence. I'm so mad I lost my keys. Upset. The next word is upset, upset. This is a really useful word. We can use it to mean angry, yes. Um, but upset means just that you are different from the regular, like your regular personality, your regular level of emotion, like your calm state. If you feel disappointed or you feel sad or you feel angry, you can use the word upset to describe that. It means you're just not in the right place. You're not quite in balance, upset. So we can use the word upset actually as a verb. It's kind of an old meaning, but like if I use my water bottle, my thermos, whatever, as an example, the verb upset means to move something from its correct position. Like, so in my case, I could say like, I upset my water bottle when I moved my arm. So I moved it from its correct position. We can use the word as an adjective then too. I'm upset, meaning my emotions have been moved from their original or their correct position. So we can use it to mean angry too. Like, I'm so upset with my boss right now, or I'm so upset with myself as well. So we usually say like, I'm upset with something or someone. In another example sentence, I'm really upset. Pissed off. Okay, warning, next one is a little bit rude, a little bit rude, um, but you might hear it in, uh, in British English and uh, you'll hear it in American English as well. Um, it's, it's sort of light on the scale of rude words, but um, the expression is pissed off, pissed off. So to say I'm really pissed off, it's a casual word, but it's, uh, it's considered a rude word. I would say it's considered a curse word in some families. Um, so uh, to mean I'm pissed off is like, it's usually for um, a fairly small thing that creates a lot of anger. So maybe if, for example, someone in your team or one of your friends makes a really, really silly mistake or just, just there's no reason for this mistake, but it creates a huge problem, you might say, oh, my God, I'm so pissed off at that person right now, or I'm just so pissed off. My feeling is that. So it's typically not for a really, really serious problem. I suppose you could use it in that way, but it usually has this um, like a very casual, slangy, 
rough feeling about it. So do not use this at work. <laughs> Don't use this with people that you respect. Um, it is not a polite phrase, but you might hear it actually in TV shows and in movies and in other media. Pissed off. I'm really pissed off right now. So please be careful. That's what it means. In a sentence, sounds like the neighbor is really pissed off. Seething with rage. Next expression is seething with rage. Seething with rage. So I included a rather formal kind of like spooky, sort of a little bit scary expression here. So like seething, it sounds like your whole body is just filled. It's like it's all, your body is almost moving because of how angry you are. So rage is a noun. Rage means a very, very high level of anger. So we talked about the word furious near the beginning of this lesson. Furious is an adjective. Rage is a noun. So anger is like an aggressive, unhappy feeling. Anger as a noun. Rage is like a few levels up there. So seething, your body is seething with rage. It's like your body is shaking. It's like your body is almost moving out of control because you are so angry. So this is a really serious issue. This is a serious level, um, seething with rage. However, this is not an expression that's commonly used in speech. We would use this in writing more often than not. You might hear this in writing or perhaps in maybe formal expressions. I don't think I've ever used this expression myself to talk about my experience or my feelings, but perhaps I could talk about it if maybe, maybe I see a fight happen, for example. I could say, whoa, that guy is like, those guys were like seething with rage, for example. So I don't know. To me, it sounds a little bit too formal to use for everyday conversations, but if, you, if you're writing a story, for example, or you're reading a story, and you want to really communicate a strong level of anger, you can say seething with rage. In a sentence, that guy at the bar was seething with rage. He was scary. Okay, next one, livid. The next word is livid, livid. Livid is an adjective. I am livid right now. So livid means angry, uh, but I think livid is like between angry and furious. So. Livid to me has the impression of maybe like extremely angry and maybe you'll, you'll shout and, or like you'll, your voice, the volume of your voice will pick up, like just livid um, about something. So yeah, very angry about a mistake, about something bad that happened. Um, so it's, I don't think it's quite at the level of furious. Uh, maybe it's just a little bit below furious, but um, like my boss was livid when he saw the reports from last month, for example. So like maybe shouting uh, or screaming or something like that. So it's not, in my head anyway, the image is that there's like a high volume reaction. Um, someone who is livid maybe has a very loud voice <laughs> in that case. In another sentence, some guy at the station was livid over a ticket charge. Lose one's temper. Okay, the next expression is kind of a set expression, um, to lose one's temper, to lose your temper. So temper is like, think of temper as your anger control, your anger control. So for you to lose your temper, it means you lose control of your anger and you begin to shout or scream or cry maybe. To lose your temper is to lose control of your angry feelings. So this is a very common expression, like my boss lost his temper with the management yesterday. Or my mom lost her temper when the dog ran into the house with dirty feet. Or, I don't know, I lost my temper when my computer wouldn't start this morning, for example. So you lose control of your anger. In another sentence, she lost her temper when her computer crashed and her work disappeared. Go off on someone. The next expression is go off on someone, to go off on someone. This is a very casual expression, very casual that we use in American English. In past tense, we'll say he went off or she went off on someone. So to go off, uh, the idea is like, you can maybe think of it as go off like a bomb, uh, if it helps, like, like a bomb could go off, like a bomb could explode. So to go off on someone is like to lose your temper at someone. Um, so it's losing your temper at the direction or in the direction of some person, but we use the expression on that person. So my boss went off on me today for all of my mistakes over the last month. I don't know. 
that's not true. Or like uh, my neighbor went off on the delivery guy for being three hours late. Um, I don't know. Uh, something that causes another person that lose their temper at someone or something. In another sentence, uh, my boss went off on one of my coworkers this afternoon. Hmm. Have a heated argument. The last expression is have a heated argument. Have a heated argument. So here the word heated is in there. Heated like hot. So meaning hot like aggressive. So a high level, maybe like a high temperature argument. So to have an argument and to have a heated argument are similar. Heated just sounds like it's uh, there's a little more intensity in the argument. So you can have an argument or you can have a discussion, whatever. Argument sounds stronger than discussion. Heated argument, therefore, is perhaps the next level of that kind of discussion or argument. So um, the neighbors are having a heated argument over there. Or I heard my boss and the CEO having a heated argument in the conference room. One more sentence. I got into a heated argument with one of my friends. Re. The first prefix is re. Re. R-E. Re means again. So we see the word re in like redo or replay or reimagine or recreate, for example. So it means to do the base word again. So whatever you see re in front of, um, or not everything, but uh, if you see re before a base word like that, it can mean to do that thing again. So in a sentence, I have to redo my homework. Anti. The next prefix is anti, anti, or you might hear anti as well. Anti or anti, both are fine. Um, but it means against or in opposition to or like kind of the opposite of something. So against, against, anti. So we see this in like um, antifreeze or antisocial or uh, anti-inflammatory or antibiotic. So they all mean against something. Um, so like the word antifreeze, for example, means like against freezing. So it's a, it's, antifreeze is a product that prevents a liquid from freezing, for example. An antibiotic is a medicine that we take to kill like bad microorganisms in our body, germs in other words. So we see bio in that word. So relating to like biology. Uh, antisocial refers to someone who does not like social situations. They are against social situations. And anti-inflammatory, another type of medicine, uh, is against inflammation. So inflammation can mean like swelling or like turning you red, for example. So anti means against something. We see anti before words which mean like opposing or against that thing. In a sentence, my boss is anti-overtime. Dis. So the next prefix is dis, dis. So dis essentially, dis means not. So we see this in words like disrespect or disapprove or disconnect or like disagree, for example. So these words all mean not plus the base word. So like disagree, for example, means to not agree or disconnect means to not connect. So something is not connected to the other thing. Uh, disrespect means to not respect something, for example. So dis means not plus that base word. In a sentence, a good editor should be disinterested. X. The next prefix is X. X. X means former. Former. So something that was once true is not true anymore. We see this very commonly in relationships. So for example, uh, ex-husband, ex-wife, ex-girlfriend, ex-boyfriend, ex-boss. So all of these mean my former something, my former boyfriend, my former girlfriend, my former boss, my former roommate, for example. In a sentence, the ex-CEO was in the news this week. Mid. The next prefix is mid, mid. So mid means like in the middle of or during something. So we can see this in a word like uh, midnight or midsummer, for example, or mid morning. So meaning in the middle of or roughly in the middle of something during that time period. Midnight means in the middle of the night or mid morning is like in the middle of the morning. So all of these refer to mid something. We can also use it for like an action, like mid meal, for example, or she was uh, mid presentation when the phone rang, for example. So mid means in the middle of something. In a sentence, I was mid breakfast when I heard the news. Ill. The next one is ill, ill. So 
il means again not, or it's like a negative prefix. It means、uh, the base word, but not that base word. So we see this in words like illogical or illegible or illegal, for example. So these all mean not plus the base word. So illogical means not logical. Uh, illegible, illegible means unable to read. Legible means readable. Illegible means cannot read that thing. Unable to read that. Illegal means not legal. In other words, so an action that is against the law. So ill means not. In a sentence, highly illogical, Captain. That's a Star Trek reference. Im. The next prefix is im. Im. I m. Im also means not. It means not. Words that fit this pattern, for example, could be impossible, or impeccable, or improbable, or imperfect, for example. So again, it means not. So imperfect means not perfect.、Uh, impossible means not possible.、Um, so im means not. It means not. In a sentence, this is impossible. In. The next prefix is in. In. So again, in also means not. It's a negative prefix that we use. There are a lot of words that start with this in, meaning not. So like inconsiderate, incapable, inconceivable,、um, inappropriate. So they all mean not plus the base word. For example, like the word inappropriate means not appropriate. So behavior that is not appropriate in a certain situation. Or incapable means not capable. Someone cannot do something they are expected to do. So in means not plus our base meaning, the opposite then of that meaning. In a sentence, he's incapable of running the country. Ear. The next prefix is ear. Ear. So the pronunciation is ear, even though it's i r. Ear. For example, we see this in like irresponsible or irredeemable or irregular. So again, this means not something. So irresponsible means not responsible. Irregular, not regular. Irredeemable is something that cannot be made up. We cannot redeem that thing. So ear is another negative prefix meaning not or no. In a sentence, your behavior was irresponsible. None. The next prefix is non, non, n o n. So, n o n is a prefix. Again, it means not or against or like I shouldn't say against. So, non also means not something.、Uh, so, for example, we see it in a word like nonsense or like nonsequential or non sequitur. So, these are words that all mean like not something. So, for example, non sense means no sense. Essentially, not sense. Uh, non sequitur. So sequitur, the base there is like、uh, think of the word sequence. We see that same sort of base in sequence、uh, as we see in non sequitur,、uh, and that actually comes from the Latin meaning like to follow something. So it, non sequitur means like it does not follow. So a non sequitur means something that just it's not part of the conversation. It's like a random comment is a non sequitur. So it does not follow. Non sequitur is one. So, non means not or no. In a sentence, this is nonsense. Break, fracture. The first word is break or fracture. So these two verbs are used interchangeably. Actually, they both refer to a broken bone or a fractured bone. So two pieces of bone become separated, or a bone becomes broken. So fractured, it comes apart. So to break a bone in present tense is I broke a bone in past tense. Fracture is a regular verb, which means the past tense is fractured. So in a sentence, I broke my wrist when I fell snowboarding. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I broke my wrist when I fell <laughs> snowboarding, and that inspired today's lesson. Sprain. The next word is sprain. Sprain to sprain something. Refers to a refers to hurting or to injuring a ligament. So a ligament are these sort of like fibrous things, like kind of、uh, they connect. They're the parts of the body inside your body. They connect bones to muscles or bones to or to like organs. They hold the parts of the body together inside. So a sprain. Is damage to a ligament a sprain? So we can say, 
、um, for example, to sprain a part of the body, a specific part of the body.、Um, some common examples come from sports injuries, like he sprained his ankle playing basketball last week, or I sprained my wrist. Uh, working in the garden or something—I don't know—but I think a sprain happens when you push the like the joint or you push that part of the body beyond the possible or the reasonable range of motion. So my example sentence—I already said it—but he sprained his ankle at the basketball game last week. Bruise. The next word is bruise. Bruise. So a bruise refers to taking like a taking an impact, something that's not a sharp impact. It's usually like a blunt impact, I suppose. I don't know. Kind of depends. But anyway, a bruise. We can use it as a noun or as a verb. Actually,、uh, to bruise something means you damage usually like a the the a certain area of skin, and blood collects under the skin. Creating like a black or blue or maybe even like greenish color, purple maybe. To use it as a noun, we can say that that spot is a bruise. We refer to that damaged area as a bruise. To use it as a verb, however, we can say I bruised my arm or I bruised my leg. So to bruise something means to cause damage, but it's like under the skin. We can see the color change、uh, because of the damage, the blood collecting there. So that's. To bruise something in a sentence, I bruised my arm when I ran into the door. Cut. The next word is cut. Cut. So cut is done with a sharp object. A cut. A cut refers to an injury, which causes blood to emerge. Usually, unless it's a very shallow cut. Shallow is the opposite of deep. So a cut is caused by a sharp. Object. So a knife is probably the most common thing that comes to mind when talking about cuts.、Um, though another very common type of cut is is called a paper cut as a noun. So、uh, if you've ever tried to take a piece of paper and the pa- the piece of paper has kind of made a small cut on your hand, that's called a paper cut. A paper cut. So、uh, it's that kind of slice motion. That injures the body is a cut. All right. In a sentence, be careful not to cut yourself when using a knife. Wound. The next word is wound. Wound. So a wound is just a place of injury on the body.、Um, we have a couple of different words we can use to be specific about wounds. They're like an open wound and a closed wound. I suppose you could say, but. Um, usually, people say things like "Don't touch open wounds." So, an open wound is usually like a fresh wound. So, something has been recently damaged on the body, recently injured, and the wound is fresh. Maybe we can see blood, or maybe we can see into the body, or something. That's considered an open wound. So, a closed wound would be perhaps a wound which has been fixed by a doctor, or for small wounds like、uh, maybe. The body has created a, a new layer over the top of the wound. That's called a scab. Ew, ew, scabs. Ew.、Uh, but that's that's not an open wound then. But we should still care for it. So a wound is a place on the body that is injured in some way. A wound.、Um, that's used as a noun. We can also use wound as a verb, which means、um, <clears throat> to hurt something, like.、Um, I wounded my arm, but wound is not so common. In, I think in everyday speech, instead we use the verb hurt. I hurt my arm, but I'll talk more about this later. So, in a sentence, don't touch open wounds. Injure. The next word is injure. Injure. So I've been talking a little bit about the word injure. To injure means to hurt a part of the body. So to injure your arm, to injure your head, to injure your neck, these mean、uh, to take damage on that part of the body, to injure something.、Um, so it's typically a bad thing to injure something.、Uh, the noun form of this word is injury. Injury. So I have an injury. We use this word more with,、uh, like, sp- perhaps sports. I guess military. Yeah, I guess so. Um, but for for every day, like just small, I don't know, for small injuries, I suppose, like 
paper cuts, for example, or like maybe a cooking accident. Um, I suppose we don't really say injury. We will say, we'll use the verb um, hurt, actually. Again, I'll talk about that word a little later. But injury, injury is damage, taking damage to a part of the body. In a sentence, she injured her shoulder this morning. Tear. The next word is tear. Tear. Be careful. This word is spelled T-E-A-R. It looks like tear. Uh, but used as a verb, it is tear, tear, to talk about an injury. So a tear, if you can imagine like a piece of paper, when we want to uh, separate it into two pieces, we can tear the piece of paper. Now imagine that same idea, but with a muscle in the body. Ugh. So a muscle tear refers to that kind of damage to the muscle. So quite painful, I think you can imagine. So to tear a muscle uh, requires, yeah, some serious recovery time, I imagine. I have never torn a muscle. Yeah, that's a good point. The past participle form is torn. Torn. Have you ever torn a muscle? Uh, or the past tense. The past tense is tore. I tore my shoulder muscle last week. I don't know. <laughs> awful, awful. Yeah. In a sentence, tearing a muscle is painful. Pull, pull, pull. So we use pull, again, with muscles, but this is different from tear. So to tear a muscle refers to this kind of break motion. So to pull a muscle means to stretch a muscle too much. So it, the muscle is like just taken beyond uh, its limits, essentially. And so it kind of causes some discomfort. There's kind of a bad feeling in the muscle. Uh, in a sentence, I think I pulled a muscle. Ouch. Dislocate dislocate, dislocate. So here we see the word locate referring to location and dis, dis which means not in other words. So to dislocate something refers to removing a part of the body from its correct position and shifting it slightly. So this is something that you hear uh, with joints. So a joint is a part of the body where two things come together. So, for example, um, a shoulder, we can talk about the shoulder and dislocate together. So, if we say a sentence like, I think I dislocated my shoulder, maybe the correct position of part of the shoulder is to fit into another bone like this. But maybe dislocating the shoulder means like it moved this way. Or I don't know how to dislocate a shoulder. But either way, the correct position is here. The dislocated position is maybe here or here. I don't know. <laughs> So the bone is not broken. There's no crack. There's no break there. It's just a shift in position. So the word we use is dislocate, to dislocate something. In a sentence, he dislocated his shoulder and popped it back into place. Ah. Hurt. Hurt. To hurt something. I've talked about this verb a few times already in this lesson. But to hurt means to injure or to wound. It's like the very general verb that we can use to describe all damage to the body. So hurt generally means kind of a small injury. Like, ah, I hurt my finger, I, sh I slammed it in the door, or ah, I think I hurt my arm playing tennis last week. We usually use this for kind of minor injuries, not such big injuries. So. In this case, for example, if I say I hurt my wrist, it sounds a little too minor, actually. This is probably a more severe injury. I would probably say, yeah, I, uh, I broke my wrist. I would use something very specific instead of hurt. To refer more generally to just small, everyday damage to the body, you can say hurt. Um, we also use this word to refer to pain in the body, too. Like, ow, my arm hurts. Ow, my wrist hurts. Instead of saying painful, we use the verb hurts more often. So it's less natural to say, my wrist is so painful. Instead, we say, my wrist hurts. It hurts is better than painful. So try that out. In a sentence, I hurt myself a lot on accident. I have an idea. The first expression is, I have an idea. I have an idea. This is a really general expression you can use to introduce a new idea. This is pretty casual, but you can use it in slightly more formal situations as well. I have an idea. Let's get Thai food for lunch. Or, yeah. I have an idea. Let's go to the beach this weekend. I have an idea. Let's take a nap. In this example sentence, 
I have an idea. Let's start a company. I've been thinking. The next expression is I've been thinking. I've been thinking. You can use this to say I've been thinking dot 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 and then begin an idea. Or you can say I've been thinking about topic. I've been thinking about topic. So I've been thinking about finding a new job. Or I've been thinking. What do you want to do for summer vacation? So you can use it in a couple of different ways. I've been thinking about, or I've been thinking. Both are okay. So in this sentence, I've been thinking about baking a cake all day. Here's a thought. The next word is here's a thought. Here's a thought. So again, this is a word you can use to introduce an idea. Here is a thought. In other words, here is an idea, a thought from my mind. Here you are. Here's a thought. So you can use this to introduce an idea you have had. Here's a thought. Why don't you get a haircut? In this example sentence, here's a thought. Why don't you take tomorrow off? What do you think? The next expression is what do you think? What do you think? Very common way to ask for someone's opinion. What do you think? We connect the words do and you quite、uh, closely in this expression. What do you think? What do you think? Sounds much more natural than what do you think. So try to use what do you think. So this is、uh, this is just a general way to ask for someone else's opinion about anything really. In a sentence, I kind of want to eat something spicy for lunch. What do you think? You want to know what I think? The next expression is, "You want to know what I think." So this is sort of a like a, a challenge almost. Like it's asking the other person, "Do you want to know my opinion? Do you want to know what I think?" Because I'll tell you only if you want to know. So you want to know what I think,、uh, or you can drop "wanna" and say, "You know what I think." So that "you" becomes "ya."、Yeah. You know what I think. You know becomes "ya you know." So you know what I think, or you want to know what I think. So it's a little bit of a challenge, a little bit of an introduction before you actually share your opinion. In a sentence, you want to know what I think. It's a terrible idea. I've thought about this a lot. The next expression is I've thought about this a lot. I've thought about this a lot. In this expression, we're actually using the present perfect tense. I've thought. I've thought. So that's I have thought about this. Meaning, I started thinking about this in the past, and my thinking has continued to the present. I've thought about this a lot. So this implies,、uh, this tells the listener, it's something that has been on your mind for a while. I've thought about this a lot. So your opinion is based on all of this past thinking. So something you have been thinking about for a long time. In a sentence, I've thought about this a lot, and I really think you should quit the company. I have no idea. I have no idea. I have no idea means I don't know, but I have no idea means zero. I have no information, no ideas. I can't think of anything. Absolutely nothing. No idea. I have no idea. So this is typically used in response to a question for information, like "Where's your brother?" I have no idea. <laughs> like, what did you do with the keys? I have no idea. So some things like you just don't, you have no information, absolutely no information. You can say I have no idea. I don't know. Please note though that the idea part of the sentence is in the singular form. I have no idea. We'll talk about why in just a moment. But I have no idea to refer to having no information about something. In another sentence, the best hotel in the city. I have no idea. I have no ideas. The next expression is "I have no ideas." I have no ideas. So here, different from "I have no idea," we're using the plural form "ideas." Ideas, meaning someone is asking you for a proposal. Someone is asking you, like, to create something, to make something, perhaps. So、um, they're asking for a suggestion, and if you don't have any suggestions, nothing to propose, you can say. I have no ideas. I have no ideas. So 
what do you want to do this weekend? I have no ideas. Or what do you want to eat for lunch? I have no ideas, really. So if you don't have any ideas, nothing to propose, you can use this with an S at the end of ideas. In another sentence, something to do this weekend? I have no ideas. I don't know. The next expression is, I don't know. I don't know. So Michael and I talked about this in an episode of English Topics many years ago. But I don't know is I don't know. The casual contracted version of I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So we use this when we don't know the answer to something. I don't know. Or when we just want to kind of like relieve pressure or when we're when when we're out of things to say as well. I don't know. So when we're like not feeling sure, not feeling confident as well, we can use this phrase. In a sentence, why are you asking me? I don't know. I knew it. The last expression is I knew it. I knew it. So here we're using the past tense of know, the verb to know something, meaning to understand or to comprehend. We're using the past tense knew. I knew it. So we use this expression when we guessed correctly about something or when something we thought was true uh, is proven to be correct. So I knew it. I knew it. So this is typically said with a positive, <laughs> a positive uh, voice. You hear this a lot in movies as well, I think. All right. In a sentence, you had my keys. I knew it. <laughs> Let's begin with the basic definition of this verb. The basic definition of the verb to put is to place something in a location. Examples. Put your bag over there. Don't put your feet on the sofa. Let's look at some conjugations for this verb now. Present, put, puts, past, put, past participle, put, progressive, putting. Let's talk about some additional meanings for the verb to put. The first one is to write, to write. Examples. Put your name on this line. She put her name on the list. So when we say put in this way, we refer to writing. So you're adding some information to a written document or a typed document as well. So it can mean to write or like to type information. So put your name on this line means like write your name or type your name on this line. In the second example sentence, she put her name on the list. It means the same thing. She wrote her name on a list or she added her name to a list in some way. It means writing information. Okay, let's go on to the second additional meaning. The second additional meaning is to use words to express something. To use words to express something. Examples. How should I put this? You're putting it quite simply. So we can replace the word put with express, like how should I express this in the first example sentence? But we use put because put sounds much less formal than express. How should I express this? It sounds way too formal, way too polite. Uh, instead, we say, how should I put this? We use that uh, expression when we're not quite sure how to say something, like we're maybe talking about a sensitive topic and we don't know the correct words to use or it's difficult to explain, you can say, how should I put this? In the second example sentence, you're putting it quite simply. It means you're expressing things quite simply. So maybe it's a complex situation, but the listener is explaining things or expressing things uh, maybe too simply. So the speaker in this case could say, you're putting it quite simply. Okay, let's go on to the third meaning. The third meaning is rather open and kind of vague, which is to cause to be in a situation. To cause to be in a situation. Let's look at some examples. This change puts the whole company at risk. Your terrible driving puts us all in danger. So in these examples, we see put is used to refer to a situation that some group of people or some person is caused to be in. So in the first example sentence, this change puts the whole company at risk. This change causes the whole company to be at risk, in a situation of risk, in a condition of risk. We use put to refer to that, to refer to being caused to be in the situation of risk. The second example sentence is the same. Your terrible driving, this is the reason, 
uh, why the people are in danger in this example sentence. Your terrible driving puts us all in danger. Your terrible driving causes us all to be in a condition of danger. It's very clumsy, but we use the verb put to make this quite short and easy to say. Your terrible driving puts us all in danger. Okay. There are so many variations, so many phrasal verbs to use with put. Yeah, so check a dictionary for more. These are just a few I'm going to introduce, but check a dictionary for this. The first variation for the verb put is put aside, to put aside. So to put aside means to stop thinking about something, to seize or to pause an activity while you do something else. Examples. Put aside your worries and relax for a day. I put my phone aside and tried to focus on my work. So in both of these example sentences, we see that one thing is kind of being moved away from the focus. So for example, in the first example sentence, put aside your worries. It means like stop thinking about your worries, like put those to the side in your mind, like, like uh, don't think about those things for a while. So in the second example sentence, I'm talking about my phone, where I'm saying I can literally put my phone aside, put my phone to the side of the thing I'm doing and focus on my work. I put my phone aside. So we can use this to talk about a concept in our minds or to talk about a physical object as well. Okay, let's go on to the next variation. So the next variation is to put someone down. It means to disrespect someone or to make fun of someone, to make them feel bad about themselves. Some examples. Don't put down your classmates, it's rude. His boss keeps putting him down in front of his coworkers. So in both of these examples, we see situations where one person is being disrespected by another person. So don't put down your classmates, it's rude. So this, in this case, um, the listener is maybe a kid in school who is disrespectful to his or her classmates. So a parent or a teacher might say, don't put down, meaning don't disrespect your classmates. Don't be mean to your classmates. Don't make fun of your classmates. So, you know, be kind to them, in other words. Don't put down your classmates. You could also say, don't put your classmates down, if you like, that's fine too. In the second example sentence, we see a work situation, like his boss always puts him down in front of his coworkers, means the boss disrespects this person in front of his coworkers. So uh, it's a disrespectful situation. Okay, um, but one point about this, the expression to put someone down uh, refers to disrespect with regard to humans. However, when talking about animals, like we had to put the cat down or we had to put the dog down, it means usually due to some serious sickness or some serious injury or illness, uh, the owners of the pet, usually a pet or the animal, um, decide that the pet should have doctor-assisted death. So to put down an animal means to choose to allow the animal to die peacefully instead of suffering. So we use that expression, I had to put my cat down. This is a much more uh, soft expression than uh, the doctor killed my cat, <laughs> which is essentially what happens. But uh, it's because of some kind of suffering or some kind of illness or injury uh, the owner wants to prevent. We use the expression to put an animal down in those cases. We do not use this for people. We don't say, I had to put my brother down. Though we do actually have an expression for babies, which, which we use when we put babies to bed. Like, I'm going to put down the baby for bed. We do have that, but please be cautious of the differences between animals and humans with this expression. To put someone down uh, has very different meanings. Okay, let's go on to the next variation, which is to put up with. To put up with means to tolerate something. Examples. I don't want to put up with this crazy schedule anymore. Don't put up with their bad behavior. In these examples, put up with refers to tolerating or being able to stand something or continuing to live with something. In the first example sentence, I can't put up with this crazy schedule anymore means I don't want to live with this crazy schedule anymore. I can't stand it. I don't want to do it anymore. In the second example sentence, don't put up with their bad behavior, it means don't tolerate their bad behavior. So put up with something means like to continue living with something. And we often see it in the negative form as in don't put up with something. Let's begin with the basic definition of this verb. The basic definition of carry is to move while holding or supporting something. Examples. 
Can you carry this bag? I always carry a pen. Okay, let's look at the conjugations for this verb. Present, carry, carries. Past, carried. Past participle, carried. Progressive, carrying. Now let's talk about some additional meanings for this verb. The first additional meaning is to move a person or an object from one place to another. Examples. Veins carry blood throughout the body. The bus carried the children to school. So here we see objects and people being moved from one place to another through or via or by something else. And we use the verb carry to describe that. In the first example sentence, veins carry blood throughout the body. Uh, veins are the, uh, like, you can see them on your arm, usually blue colored. They're the kind of like pipes, I guess you could say, like imagine them as pipes that carry blood. So blood travels through the body through these veins. So we can say veins carry blood through the body. So veins are the method through which blood moves throughout the body. So veins are carrying the blood. We kind of can imagine in that way. They're carrying, they're responsible for carrying the blood. So we can say that veins are kind of responsible for moving blood around the body. We can use the verb carry to explain that. In the second example sentence, the bus carried the kids to school. The bus is the method of transport for the kids. So the kids are moving from one place to another place. The bus is the method of movement. So the bus carried the kids to school. We can use carry to talk about this transportation. The second additional meaning is to have a gene or illness. Examples. Rodents are known to carry rabies. Some people carry diseases they don't know about. In the first example sentence, we see rodents are known to carry rabies. So rodents are like small, like rats or mice, those kinds of dirty sort of creatures, wild creatures. Rabies is a disease, a serious illness that like causes you to behave strangely and your body has really strange problems too. I won't talk about rabies that much, not so important here. But rodents are known to carry rabies. So the, um, the small, like the biological parts, the things that cause rabies, they carry that illness. Rodents are known to carry. So it doesn't mean carry like a backpack really, but carry a gene or carry an illness, carry a sickness inside the body. In this case, rodents are known to carry the sickness that is rabies inside their bodies. In the second example sentence, some people carry diseases they don't know about. It means some people have diseases in their body but they don't know about the disease. So you can imagine like we carry the disease, we hold it in our body and we move around, but we don't know about it. We use the verb carry to talk about this. Let's move on to the third meaning. The third additional meaning is to make something a success, to make something a success. Examples. His leadership carried the team through a difficult time. Her performance carries the show. So in both of these examples, we see that someone carried something. So someone caused something to be successful because of their actions or because of their leadership, as we see in the first example sentence. So his leadership carried the team through a difficult time means the team was successful in a difficult time because of his leadership. But we use the verb carry to mean that. So we can kind of imagine that this one person, in this case, his leadership, his leadership um, and his abilities to be a good leader, in other words, were kind of the thing that carried the team. So we can imagine the whole team is on top of this one guy's leadership skills. So he is responsible for making the team a success in a difficult time. So we use carry to explain that. In the second example sentence, her performance carried the show. It means her performance was so good, it was so important that the show was a success because of it. So without her performance, maybe the show would not have been successful, but her performance was really, really good. Her performance made the show a success. Her performance carried the show. The fourth meaning of this verb is to reach a distance, to reach a distance. This can be like sound or it can be something physical. Some examples of this. The sound of the thunder carried 20 kilometers. 
ash from the volcano carried into the air. So here, we're not actually carrying a physical object. In the first example sentence, it's sound traveling. So the sound of thunder carried 20 kilometers. It means we were able to hear the sound of thunder 20 kilometers away from the source. So the sound carried, in other words. We use carry to refer to sound traveling a distance. In the second example sentence, ash from the volcano carried into the air. It means the ash from the volcano moved into the air. We could even say like the ash from the volcano carried into the next city, for example. So it traveled into the next city. It traveled some distance, but we can use carry to talk about that as well. Let's move on to some variations for this verb. So the first variation is to get carried away. To get carried away, this means to get too excited or too involved in something. Usually it has like a positive meaning. We get carried away because we're excited um, about something, but let's look at some examples first. I got a little carried away baking last night. He got carried away listening to music. Both of these examples are pretty innocent. In the first example sentence, we see, I got a little carried away baking last night. It's like I baked too much last night. The idea is that I was too excited about my baking and I baked too much, or maybe I stayed up too late baking something. I got carried away with it. I did too much of it because I was so interested in this thing. In the second example sentence, he got carried away listening to music. It maybe means he spent too much time listening to music. Maybe he forgot to do his homework or he forgot to go to work or he was late for work or something because he was carried away. He was so interested in listening to music, he forgot something or he did too much of it, in other words. So this generally just means that you're too excited about something or too involved in something. So it can have a positive meaning. The next variation is to carry over. To carry over means to continue into the next period, to continue into the next period. Examples. Unused data will carry over into the next month. My airline miles carried over into this year. So these two expressions both use like points or miles or some kind of data. In the first example sentence, it's like a mobile phone contract. Unused data will carry over into the next month. If, for example, I have one gig of data available on my mobile phone every month, but I only use 500 megabytes, I have 500 megabytes remaining. That's my unused data. That amount carries over to the next month. That means I have one gigabyte plus 500 megabytes of data to use in the next month. So carry over means that amount continues to the next period. We see the same thing in the second example sentence. My airline miles carried over into this year, meaning my airline miles from the previous year carried over or continued into this year. So maybe I didn't use those miles last year, but they continued into this year and I can still use them. So carrying over means continuing something. We see it a lot in like credit card contracts or like mileage plans or data plans. Anything with data, points, numbers, we might see that sort of thing. The basic definition of the verb catch is to gain hold of something that is traveling through the air, moving through the air usually. Examples. She caught the ball. Catch this. Let's look at the conjugations for this verb. Present, catch, catches. Past, caught. Past participle, caught. Progressive, catching. Now let's talk about some additional meanings for this verb. The first additional meaning for this verb is to find or see someone doing something wrong. Some examples. I caught you trying to steal from the company safe. Have you ever been caught eating late at night? So in both of these example sentences, we see behavior being discovered that is wrong in some way. In the first example sentence, I caught you trying to steal from the company safe. Someone was discovered trying to steal from the company's safe. That was a bad behavior. So we use the verb catch. In this case, past tense, caught. I caught you, meaning I discovered you. I saw you doing this thing that was bad. 
We see the same thing in the second example sentence, but it's phrased as a question. Have you ever been caught eating late at night? So eating late at night is kind of considered to be unhealthy. It's not typically a good behavior. So we can use the verb catch in this case, caught. Have you ever been caught? The past participle form to express this question. Have you ever been caught eating late at night? Let's move on to the second additional meaning for this verb, which is to be held or stuck to something. So examples: My jacket got caught on the door. I caught my hair on a hook. So both of these examples refer to something on our bodies. Like the first example sentence is about a jacket, but we can use it for clothing. So it's like if your clothing gets caught on something. This is. My shirt is caught on my finger right now. I would say so it's stuck here. I can't move it, so I have to release it from my finger. We use caught to talk about that. My second example sentence was about my hair. Like I got my hair caught on a hook, or I caught my hair on a hook. It's somehow stuck or attached to something else. So we use catch to talk about this. Of course, we can use it with other things, like headphones, for example. Like I always catch my headphones on doorknobs. That is true. Like the doorknobs to like or door handles. Like、yeah. my headphones like will wrap around as I'm leaving the house, and like ah, like I get stuck <laughs> on that. That happens all the time. So you can use it to talk about your body parts, your clothing, or just other objects too that get held in place on accident. With catch, I got something caught on something else. The third additional meaning for this verb is to be able to hear something. To be able to hear something. Examples: I didn't catch what you said. She couldn't catch any of the announcements in the noisy train station. So this means to be able to hear something. In the first example sentence, it's a negative. I didn't catch what you said. In other words, I was not able to hear what you said. I didn't catch what you said, or I didn't catch that means I couldn't hear you. In other words, in the second example sentence, it's about a noisy train station where a person cannot catch the announcements, can't hear the announcements. I can't quite catch what the announcements are saying. So that means it's difficult to hear or it's difficult to understand the announcements because it's a noisy environment. So catch can mean be able to hear something. Okay. The fourth additional meaning for this verb is to start burning, like to start a fire specifically. Examples: His house caught fire late last night. The curtains caught fire because they were too close to a candle. So, to catch fire means to start fire, to start something burning. To catch fire is the moment that a flame appears somewhere. So, catching fire is not、um, like kind of the smoldering coals, not like the glowing coals in something, but it's actual flame. So, to start a fire, it's like that moment of wow, like there's suddenly heat, and there's suddenly you know like a candle, for example. The candle we can light a candle on fire, though. I should say we tend to use the expression "catches fire" or something caught fire because of an accident. So we don't say like,、um, "I went camping and the wood caught on fire." We use "caught on fire" for like something that was maybe not on purpose. So in my two example sentences, the first one, "His house caught on fire late last night." He wasn't planning for his house to. Go up in flames, but it happened. In the second example sentence, it's curtains too close to a candle. So there's kind of this nuance of an accident, a bad accident. If you don't want to imply an accident, if you want to show that something was on purpose, you can use the verb light, past tense lit, like I lit a fire with a lighter, or let's light a fire in the barbecue, for example. So to light a fire is on purpose. For something to catch fire sounds like oh, it was maybe an accident or. Not on purpose. Let's move on to some variations for this verb now. The first variation is to catch someone's eye. To catch someone's eye, this means to attract attention, usually for a positive reason. Examples: That sale caught my eye. An advertisement for a wine party caught his eye. So this is kind of a strange expression when you think about it. Like to catch someone's eye, it's like. 
kind of gross. Like you imagine like someone's eyeball like, catching an eyeball, but actually it just means drawing the attention of the eye. So in the first example sentence, it's about a sale. The sale caught my eye. So meaning I saw an advertisement for a sale. My eye was attracted to the advertisement for that. The second example sentence is the same. An advertisement for a wine party caught his eye. So there's some wine party, tasting wines, whatever. For whatever reason, it attracts his eyes. It attracts his vision, so he looks at it. We say it caught his eye. Attracts attention, usually for a positive reason. So the second variation is to catch up with. To catch up with. So this is an expression that means to talk about life since the last time you met. Some examples. I caught up with a friend from elementary school. Let's catch up again soon. So catching up with someone refers to talking with another person or talking with other people about the recent events in your life. So from the last time you saw someone, what have you done? So if you haven't seen someone since elementary school, as in the first example sentence, you talk about all the things that you have done since elementary school. So maybe that's a long time for some of you. Or if it's somebody that you have seen recently, you could try using the second example sentence. Let's catch up again soon. Meaning maybe after a few weeks or a month or so, you want to meet that person again and find out what they did. So this is a nice expression that's like you want to know what the other person is doing or what they have done since the last time you saw them. Let's catch up. The basic definition of this verb is to put something in a specified location. Examples: I placed my cup on the desk. She placed her earrings next to the bed. Let's look at the conjugations for this verb: present, place, places, past, placed, past participle, placed, progressive, placing. Now let's talk about some additional meanings for this verb. So let's look at the first additional meaning of this. It's to make. To make. This is commonly used as to make an order or to make a bet. Let's look at some examples of this. Place your bets. She placed an order for fifty plates of fried rice. So here we see place being used to mean make. The first example sentence: "Place your bets." That's an example of a sentence you'll hear at a casino. So、uh, dealers, card dealers inside casinos, will often begin a card game by saying "Place your bets" to the people who are playing, which means make your bet or decide on an amount of money you want to play for this game. They use the verb "place." Place your bets. Maybe you'll hear "make your bet," but I think "place your bet" is probably the most common expression used. In the second example, we see. Placed an order. She placed an order. You can substitute make here. You can say she made an order for. But to place an order, this is just a different way to say it. To me, place an order sounds a little more polite than make an order. Like you could use. Both on the phone, I suppose. Like I'd like to make an order for. I'd like to place an order for. Both would be okay. To me, place sounds maybe a little bit more polite, but it means to make something, to make an order, or in the first example, to make a bet. The second additional meaning is to recognize. To recognize this meaning, as you'll see in the example sentences, is often in the negative form. Let's look at some examples. I feel like I've seen that guy somewhere before. But I just can't place him. I can't place this quote. Who said it? So here we see place being used to mean like recognize, or we can't quite understand the origin of that person or that thing. In the first example sentence, we see I just can't place him. We're talking about someone's face. So if you know someone's face, but maybe you can't remember the name, or in this case you don't remember where you met that person or your connection to that person, you can say, "I just can't place him," meaning I don't know why I know this person, but I recognize his face. So here we see the negative. This is commonly used in the negative. I can't place him. In the second example sentence, I can't place this quote means I don't know where this quote originated from, or I don't know where this quote came from. So maybe it's a famous person who said the quote, but I just can't remember who that is. I can't like recognize. I can't、uh, recall 
where this information came from. I can't place this quote. So this means to recognize in these cases. Okay, the third additional meaning is to put in a certain condition or state. Examples. The court placed him under arrest. She was placed on a strict contract. So in both of these example sentences, we see some condition being set. In the first example, we see placed under arrest. Placed under arrest means the person involved was put in the condition of arrest. Placed under arrest. In the second example sentence, she was placed on a strict contract. It means she was put into a condition of a strict contract. So we use placed to refer to that. So to place can mean to put someone or something into a state or into a condition. The fourth additional meaning is to find someone a location to live or work. Examples. We haven't placed the young man yet. They're placing the family next week. So in these example sentences, someone is looking for a spot to live or a spot to work for another person. There are two groups or two parties involved here. In the first example sentence, we haven't placed the young man yet. It means the speaker or the group involved with the speaker is looking for a location for the young man in the situation to live or work. So what is the situation? This does seem kind of strange perhaps, but um, in some countries, maybe it's similar in your country, there may be kind of like protection services, especially for children and for families who have had like legal trouble or trouble with um, like dangerous people in their lives and they need to be relocated to a new city or to a new workplace. So there are services for families like that, for individuals like that. That's a situation where we might use this word. We also might see this in like schools, for example. If you are looking for a location, looking for a classroom, looking for or, um, a dorm or something for a student. So one person is responsible for finding a place, for finding a location for another person. We can use place to talk about that. In the second example sentence, they're placing the family next week. It means they're completing the placing process. So that means they have found a place, they have found a location for a family and are going to take the family to that location next week. So to place is to find a location for someone. Let's move on to some variations for this verb. The first variation is to find one's place, to find one's place. This means to determine how to fit in socially. Okay, examples of this. I think I finally found my place. She's having trouble finding her place at school. So here, we're seeing examples that involve someone finding their social position. So to find one's place means to find a nice position, a position that's appropriate for them in their society or within their life. In the first example, I think I finally found my place. We see past tense found my place, which means I've discovered this position is best for me. In the second example sentence, she's having trouble finding her place at school. It means she's having trouble positioning herself within the society that is her school. Like she has her school life and she hasn't quite discovered yet the best uh, location for her, the best way to fit in with the people around her. So this refers to your societal position in your small or big society. The next variation is to know one's place, to know one's place. This refers to understanding your status in society, and it's typically used to refer to people who are below others as well. Like we typically don't use this to talk about people who are above us. We might use it to talk about ourselves in reference to being below someone, or someone from a higher position might talk about the people below them, oftentimes with a kind of disrespect. Let's look at some examples. He made sure his workers always knew their place. I know my place. That restaurant is way too nice for me to visit. So here we see examples of people behaving or being expected to behave in accordance with their social status. In the first one, he made sure his workers always knew their place. 
The nuance here is that he is like some kind of boss or like authority figure. And the others, the workers, which we see workers indicates they're below him. They know their place. So in other words, they know that their role, they know that their status in society is lower and he wants to make sure they know that. So this has a bit of an air of disrespect about it. In the second example sentence, it's a person talking about himself or herself. I know my place. That restaurant is too nice for me. Meaning, I know that I am societally of a level below the level required to visit that restaurant. So in other words, I shouldn't go there. It's too nice. It's too expensive. It's too fancy for me. I know my place is below that restaurant. So interesting. Very interesting. Listen to the dialogue. What do you do? I'm an artist. Listen to it again. What do you do? I'm an artist. First of all, you need to learn how to say, What do you do? What do you do? Listen to it again. What do you do? What do you do? Now, how do you answer this question? This is the pattern you'll need. I'm a, I'm an, your occupation. I'm a, an, your occupation. For example, I'm an artist. I'm an artist. I'm an artist. Here are a few more professions you can use with the same pattern. Police officer. Police officer. Police officer. Teacher. 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 Doctor. 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 Engineer. 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 Now, listen to some examples. What do you do? I'm a teacher. What do you do? I'm a doctor. What do you do? I am an engineer. Okay, now it's your turn. Do you remember how to say, what do you do? What do you do? Imagine you're a doctor. Do you remember how to say doctor? Doctor. Doctor. Say, I'm a doctor. I'm a doctor. Now answer the question saying that you are a doctor. What do you do? I'm a doctor. Now, imagine you're a teacher. Do you remember how to say teacher? Teacher. Teacher. Say, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher. Now, answer the question saying that you are a teacher. What do you do? I'm a teacher. Now, imagine you're an engineer. Do you remember how to say engineer? Engineer. Engineer. Say, I'm an engineer. I am an engineer. Now, answer the question saying that you are an engineer. What do you do? I am an engineer. First question this week comes from 
Sithi. Hi, Sithi. Sithi says, hi, Alicia. What is the difference between figure out and find out? in terms of meaning and when to use, etc. Okay, nice question. So first, let's look at figure out. To figure out means to solve. We use figure out when we have a challenging problem or we have like a complex puzzle, something that we need to do research on or we need to investigate into a little bit in order to find a solution. So to figure out means to solve. For example, I can't figure out what's wrong with my computer. I figured out why the house smelled so bad. Someone forgot to take out the garbage. We need to figure out why the software isn't working. So let's compare this to find out. To find out means to discover, especially when we're talking about a secret or a surprise or something else that we need to hide for some reason. You may also hear it used as a neutral way to say discover, but you can kind of tell depending on the context. So to find out means to discover, especially when you're talking about a secret. For example, my parents found out I left the house late last night. My boss found out one of our employees has been stealing. Hey, I found out about a great new restaurant in the neighborhood. Want to go? So we don't use these words interchangeably. In some, to figure something out means to solve something, like a puzzle, or you're finding the solution to a challenge. To find out means to discover, and it often has a negative meaning, as when someone finds information that they were not meant to find. So I hope that this helps you understand the difference. Thanks for the question. OK, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Jerry Song. Hi, Jerry. Jerry says, I usually watch TV shows to practice listening, but sometimes I can't clearly hear what the characters say, even though I know the words when I see them in the subtitles. So how do I improve this? Ah, that's a good question. Keep in mind that there are a few reasons why it might be difficult to understand a character, especially in unscripted TV, like reality TV, where people aren't always speaking clearly. The words that people choose and the way that they make sentences may not be perfect. So please keep that in mind. Um, people in unscripted TV shows often are not speaking clearly, or maybe they have a specific accent or a special way that they speak. Uh, they may also just be stopping and starting in the middle of sentences, and that can create some weird sounds too. So try to keep in mind that unscripted TV in particular um, might not sound as clear as scripted TV. It might not sound as clear as like this YouTube channel either. So those are a couple of things to keep in mind. Other things that you can consider though are reductions in speech and just speed of speech. So on this channel, we speak at a slower rate than native pace, and we also make an effort to speak very clearly to help people as they learn English. But native speakers don't do this usually. Something in general to consider, like even though characters may have accents that are difficult to understand, even for native speakers, something that you can consider for your English learning is to consider reductions in speech. So by that I mean the connections that we make between words and the ways that we make words shorter. For example, I'm going to go to the store to pick up something for dinner. That sentence said by a native speaker at native speed would probably sound something like, I'm going to go to the store to pick up something for dinner. So we've reduced a lot of those sounds together. These words like I'm going to go that are very commonly used together are often reduced to I'm going to go or I'm going to go to the. So think about these common reductions that you hear uh, on TV and in movies and so on and try to practice those in addition to considering how it looks on the page. So yes, it's I am going to in the subtitle or I'm going to, but at native speed it doesn't sound like that in many cases. I'm going to go to the is how I'm going to go to the or I'm going to go to the sounds in native speech. So another point about reductions in speech is prepositional phrases. So those words like to and at and by 
and even conjunctions like and and but and so on, those words tend to get very, very short when we're speaking quickly because they're kind of giving us the structure of the sentence. So you can think of these sort of structure words as being sort of the background of the sentence and the content words like the nouns and the verbs are kind of taking the focus. Those are sort of the highlights. So these are some other things that you can think of as you're practicing your listening and your speaking with reductions. So please keep these things in mind and also keep in mind, as I said, people speak with different accents too. People from different areas of the U.S. speak differently. People from different areas of the world speak different kinds of English too. So please keep in mind that in some cases it's actually difficult for native speakers as well. But another thing that maybe you can work on to kind of advance your listening and even your speaking uh, is to consider reductions. So listening for those reductions and then considering how you can use those reductions in your speech as well to sound more natural. So that would be my suggestion for improving your listening uh, and improving your speaking as you practice with these reductions in your own speech too. So I hope that that helps you. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Junaid Raza. Junaid Raza, hello Junaid. Junaid says, hello Alicia. Most people are confused about the difference between motivation and inspiration. I know there are definitions available in dictionaries, but can you differentiate these two words in detail? Okay, sure. So inspiration is something that gives us an idea. So we use inspiration to create something new. Inspiration is something that comes naturally. It comes from within us. So we have an experience. We see something or touch something. We hear something. We smell something, taste something, whatever. We have some kind of experience and it gives us an idea. So it comes from like inside us. This idea comes from inside us based on this experience that we had. So for example, my mother's stories were my inspiration for this book. Or my childhood by the seashore was my inspiration for this dish. So these are the things that gave the speaker an idea to create something else. In the first example there, the speaker's stories were the inspiration for this book. So that means the speaker's mother's stories were the thing that gave the speaker the idea. In the second example sentence, we can imagine it's about a chef. So the chef's inspiration was a childhood by the seaside. So that gave the chef the inspiration to create that dish. So it's something that happens and there's a natural response in a person that makes them think, I'm gonna create something. In contrast then, motivation is something that comes from outside us that gives us a push or that helps us to continue doing something. And motivation is usually for something that we maybe don't really want to do. So like on this channel, we talk a lot about finding motivation to study. So maybe studying is not something that many people want to do, but we can recognize the benefits of that. So we need to find different motivations for our studies. So some examples. My mother's encouragement provided the motivation I needed to finish writing my book. My motivation to create this dish was to share my childhood with the people who eat at my restaurant. So in these sentences that are kind of slightly changed from the first pair of sentences I introduced, we're talking about like the outside reason to do something. So inspiration refers to something that kind of comes naturally from within you. Motivation is more external. It's something that's pushing you or causing you to move forward or to start something, to continue something. And it's often for something we might not otherwise have done if this outside force had not been there. I would also say that personally, I think I probably use the verb forms more than the noun forms here. So that means I would use something like, this music really inspired me and I hope to create my own music one day or my promotion really motivated me to work harder so personally I think I tend to use these as verbs a little more often than as nouns but uh, this is the difference in terms of meaning between the two so I hope that this helps you thanks for the question okay let's move on to your next question next question comes from Tom hi Tom Tom says is it correct to say my favorite song of all times or do you have to use the form all time. Yeah, nice point. We always say all time. We do not use 
all times. Let's look at a few more examples. The greatest of all time. My all-time favorite food. The most popular songs of all time. So you'll notice in these examples, there are actually two patterns that we can use. The something of all time pattern and the all hyphen time plus adjective pattern. Both are correct. You can use both in whatever situation you choose. They have the same meaning and the same feel. Just note that these positions and patterns are slightly different. Also note that we always use the singular time there. We're not using time. So please make sure it's always all time greatest of all time, and so on. So I hope that this helps you. Thanks very much for the question. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Mifta. Hi again, Mifta. Mifta says, hi, Alicia. I've heard the idiom play Russian roulette. How do we use it? Thanks. Okay, nice one. This is a very dark idiom that refers to a very, very dangerous game. So the origin of this idiom is a game, an actual game, called Russian Roulette. So in the game of Russian Roulette, one type of gun that's called a revolver uh, is removed of all of the bullets except for one. So one bullet remains in the revolver's chamber. So this is the part of the gun where the bullets are kept, the bullets are held. So one bullet is inserted into the chamber of a revolver and then the player spins the chamber and closes the chamber and we don't know where the bullet is. Then the player points the gun at their own head or at someone else's head and pulls the trigger. So this is a very dangerous and very risky game. So this is of course not a game that I recommend in any way, but this is the origin of this idiom. Today, this idiom means to do something very dangerous or to do something very risky. So it has a very dark origin, so we tend to use it to mean something very dark. For example, He's playing Russian roulette with his career by skipping work all the time. So in this example sentence, the item that is kind of in danger is his career. So playing Russian roulette with his career. So his career is the thing that is in danger. We know that because it's connected to Russian roulette. So to play Russian roulette with this thing in danger. And the action, the risky behavior, is skipping work all the time. So he's playing Russian roulette with his career by skipping work all the time. That would mean, uh, in a non-idiomatic expression, he's in danger of losing his job at any moment because he skips work all the time. One more example. They're playing Russian roulette with their savings by making this awful investment. So again here, after Russian roulette, we see with their savings. So here savings refers to like a savings account or money in someone's savings. So that's the thing in danger. That is the item of danger here. And then the risky behavior is by making an awful investment or by making this awful investment. So the they in this situation is making this terrible investment, this risky investment, and putting their savings at risk. So to play Russian roulette means to do something very risky and very dangerous, and it has a very dark and negative feel. Great work! Here's a reward. Speed up your language learning with our PDF lessons. Get all of our best PDF cheat sheets and ebooks for free. Just click the link in the description.